Good evening to you all from different time zones. Welcome everyone to the Taishin Global Webinar. I'm Li Xing. This is the fifth Taishin Global Webinar on coronavirus series and a very special one. In the previous webinars, we talked about economy, supply chain, medical experiences, oil prices. But this one is addressing a much broader and more fundamental question, the humanity side combating the virus. How can the non-government players help? Economies are coming to a hard stop and job losses everywhere. How to protect the rapidly enlarging vulnerable groups? And there are nearly 3 billion people around the globe under lockdown. How to cheer everyone up and keep them with good spirit? All the charitable acts come in all shapes, sizes, forms, cross-culture. Together, they're weaving a safety net against the COVID-19. There are experiences that can be shared cross borders and there are also collaborations that we can explore. And that what, that's exactly what brings us here today. Uh, we're very privileged to have four distinguished speakers today leading, or, leading one or a group of foundations. Two are based in China, Mr. Lu Mai, the Vice Chairman of China Development Research Foundation, who is one of the most iconic figures in China's rural reform and poverty alleviation and Ms. Zhuya Mei, Executive Director of BGI Group, China's leading gen genome sequencing company and Secretary General of a very young foundation. And also connecting from Brussels, we have Mr. Gerard Salo, Chief Executive of European Foundation Center, empowering more than 200 foundations from 33 European countries. Correct me if the uh, numbers uh, run. Um, Jerry also worked in many years in South Africa, Ethiopia for various foundations and the UN. And also dialing from New York is Ms. Elizabeth Kenup, China Director for Ford Foundation with in-depth understanding of the philo philanthropic um, organizations in both countries. So we will hear from each speakers. Uh, they will give us a presentation of how them and each organization is com combating the virus. And then I'm uh, uh, we'll start the Q&A session with a special commentator and a fire starter, Dr. Wang Zhengyao, and then we'll move on to the Q&A with the audience. You can use the Q&A button, just press the button and type in your question there and we'll pick up from there. So uh, let's start from Mr. Lu Mai, Lu Mai Laoshi. CDRF is both a think tank and I would say a group <gasps> tank, organizing very high level international conferences, also conducting various projects, especially on poverty alleviation and rural help. Um, I will use one number and then I'll turn that to you. We published an article last week that uh, CDRF conducted a very important survey that shows more than 50% of Chinese rural students can actually, actually don't, um, cannot access to the remote uh, education online, virtual online education. So we're talking about millions of kids there, and that's very important work we are doing. You are doing mapping this out. So um, tell us how to help rural China combat the virus, and how to how do you see the international collaboration? Oh, thank you. I'm very honored to speak here. Uh, CDRF uh, is nonprofit organization. Our mission is to advance uh, good governance and the policy to promote economic development and uh, social progress in China. So uh, we got a lot of help uh, from uh, uh, different institutions. Uh, we are very proud of a partner uh, with them. So uh, again this year, in the, November, uh, in the January, uh, we are uh, very happy with this year. We have a big plan. We want to hold the China Development Forum in March. We want to conduct uh, our program, uh, especially several programs uh, already recognized uh, by the Chinese uh, government. And uh, uh, local government uh, is happy to be a partner. But then this uh, COVID-19 happened, outbreak uh, in China. So everything changed. This is a big shock uh, for us. Uh, we stay at home at the beginning, uh, 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 late of January and the beginning of the February. And then we recognize we have to do something. Uh, CDIF uh, started by to think about those uh, rural areas. Uh, they are more 
vulnerable. So a uh, migrant uh, worker come back from Wuhan, from Hubei, uh, to those uh, poverty uh, counties. And uh, they have uh, not so much of the equipment or uh, the protection or the healthcare uh, system. Uh, so those uh, poverty area county is uh, vulnerable, uh, especially uh, later we heard that uh, one county only 87 face masks uh, left uh, in the storage. So uh, we think this is the first thing that we need to do. So uh, we call the friend, we call the company uh, for the help. And uh, the first uh, supply come from uh, Germany, uh, from uh, a company's friend, uh, friend. And then we send this uh, to Xinjiang, to Jimunai County. And totally, uh, we re and also we raised the fund uh, from a, a website, the Alipay. And uh, in the three days, we raised uh, 1 million uh, RMB and we buy the mask and also got a donation from a state-owned enterprises and uh, those uh, foreign company, multinational company, like a uh, star uh, company and uh, also uh, like a uh, potential. So we are happy to send those uh, to 29 uh, counties and uh, it's uh, totally it's a uh, uh, 600,000 pieces of the mask, about the clothes, about the eyeglasses. And uh, in the end, we're very glad to hear. Also, uh, eight counties have uh, some cases, but not so many, and uh, it's under control. Other 21 counties has no cases. So they did a good job uh, to protect uh, the farmers. And uh, our supply is uh, just uh, come on time. Uh, for those uh, uh, healthcare worker, so this is the uh, one thing we 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 did uh, the earlier uh, February. Uh, when China's uh, situation getting um, a little bit stable, we uh, feel uh, grateful to our partner, and uh, we ask of them what's the situation uh, abroad. The situation become the very serious. Thing. We got a uh, letter uh, reply uh, from uh, Italy. Italy former premier uh, uh, Prodi uh, wrote to me and uh, say uh, they face a shortage of protection supply, a uh, protective uh, supply, and would like to see assistance. So uh, immediately is the uh, uh, risk uh, the. the the, the, the song to us and uh, we call the friends on the yard and uh, we call the uh, partner uh, so we work together to get the the, the supply there uh, the china global philanthropy institute and uh, to china hub uh, we go together and uh, uh, send a, a lot of uh, material uh, to them including the 16 uh, bracing machine. And uh, I think uh, that's uh, uh, maybe just a small part of the uh, material they need, but it show that uh, I sincerely hope uh, they're getting better. To raise the fund or to collect the material is the one thing, but we are a small organization and with a limited uh, fund. So, the best things that we can do is uh, to provide the information. So we organize uh, two things, uh, China development briefing. So invite the expert uh, about uh, healthcare and uh, about the public health. Uh, totally we uh, hold this uh, four times to provide the situation in China. Look at these uh, two faces there famous uh, expert in China, and uh, they contribute uh, uh, valuable uh, suggestion and uh, their experience. Uh, I wish 
I wish uh, some politicians in U.S. attend this uh, briefing, but uh, very unfortunately, uh, we hold that uh, in February, but uh, not so many people listen. So, and uh, in the March, uh, well, the recession is uh, looks like uh, very serious. So we hold a webinar to invite uh, famous uh, professors. Uh, uh, and the uh, international expert to come together, totally the moment 20, to discuss about how to deal with this uh, new economic phenomena and uh, what we should do uh, together. So we got a lot of uh, uh, good suggestion and uh, information, and uh, we provide those uh, information to the public and uh, to the government, help government to make a uh, a good policy uh, in advance when we're still dealing with uh, this uh, pandemic. So uh, th this is uh, information sharing. This is uh, uh, very important uh, for us. Uh, it's a part of China Development Forum. But uh, in the March, we started to think about uh, uh, what we can do. Uh, in the January and February, uh, CDIF uh, hold a, a, a reading salon, and uh, all the staff contribute one or two books that they read and uh, share with others. Those books, uh, some are very seriously politi uh, political, but uh, it's also a, a very interesting other book. So. It's help us to rethinking our project. This stuff, this uh, 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 two months is a uh, uh, very good uh, break. And uh, we rethinking our 10 projects in the poverty area, started from uh, breastfeeding, uh, zero to three uh, home visiting, and uh, preschool for the three to six, and the school meal and the vocational training, all those uh, programs, we have a, a intensive discussion how to improve it. For example, for zero to three home visiting, we found that the home visitor did uh, what the program asked them to do, but they didn't understand why they need to do that. So we help them to realize this is a help a family to take care of the baby better, especially for those uh, disadvantaged uh, family, uh, they need to pay attention. So we have uh, eight key points and uh, we will distribute a new handbook for them. Uh, for the preschool education, it's also very good because uh, last year we did a session, uh, uh, assessment and uh, provide this uh, to Chinese government. But this year, after this assessment, we realized that some uh, schools' environment need to be improved and uh, some technology we should be in, uh, use. And uh, for school meal, uh, that's uh, very interesting to see. Uh, we, we were used to go to the county level to tell them, but this is the time we use the webinar to treat 9,000 cook and uh, teachers uh, in the school. So it's amazing. We ask them, this is a different uh, time compared with the 10 years ago. 10 years ago, the children is starving, but now they need a more uh, healthy, it's a better nutrition. And uh, we ask them how to cook uh, we show their picture. So those uh, uh, the tra uh, training program we run, so very, very effective. Uh, uh, they even use uh, uh, iPad. Uh, we got the donation from uh, uh, Apple and uh, use that uh, for our program. So uh, those are something we did. The new technology help us during this uh, difficult time. For next, uh, uh, period, uh, for next uh, stage, uh, China and the world so now is uh, getting a uh, better situation. China is a little bit uh, 
uh, in advance, but we see the good news that from a Europe country, and uh, uh, we need to prepare. The next uh, time uh, maybe is come from Africa. So, um, uh, Xie Lan, Professor Xie Lan, and uh, uh, from Tsinghua University and the CDRF will write a handbook. Uh, and then translate it into English and uh, French and uh, uh, distribute uh, in the, Af the other developing country as uh, free information. Uh, it will include uh, uh, the decision making, the, the, the governance, and uh, uh, public health, and uh, also uh, the hospital uh, doctor, uh, so on. So that's uh, one. And then another one is uh, uh, this. Uh, COVID-19 shows some shortage, short, shortcoming uh, in China's uh, healthcare system. But in broad way, uh, we need to think about the uh, rural and the China uh, and the city, the gap between these two. And also we need to think about the uh, uh, social welfare. So that's uh, the issue we're working on for next uh, 14, five years plan. Uh, that's, I should, I should end it here, but uh, most of those time uh, work is uh, did by my colleague, colleagues. Uh, they are young, energetic, and uh, 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 very good thinking. And uh, I'm very good. Uh, I'm very glad to work with them now. Uh, so, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the very wonderful sharing and a lot of information in that from the very macro, the international collaborations and providing the help to other countries to the very practical tips on how to keep the organizational work ongoing in the foundation, especially some of your day to day work is not directly related to the virus, but they are equally important to closing the digital divide providing the social welfare to the rural areas. I think a lot of uh, tips that others can uh, learn from. Uh, we'll follow the timeline of the uh, the timeline of the outbreak and uh, shift to Europe. I'll, I'll switch to Jerry. And how are the European foundations battling the virus? You come from the more macro view, macro view from the uh, foundation organizations. And what are the key challenges you would identify? And uh, what would be the creative ways or the most effective ways that you have seen? Okay, well, thank you very much. I thought you might go to Zhu Yan Mei first, but uh, um, I'm, I'm happy to, to go now if you want. Um, so, um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. And I will talk a little bit about the FC just to put it in context so that I explain why my remarks are uh, the way they are. And I would like to spend a little bit of time just on some examples of different things uh, that have happened. It's good to see uh, good friends on the screen. Uh, hello. Um, let me start with saying just the EFC is a membership organization and so we are essentially a, a, um, a clearing house for information for our members and especially when a crisis comes this is something that becomes very important and so we have followed that sequence of trying to collect what are people doing. Now I have to preface all my remarks by saying that foundations are so different. They're so different in size. They're so different in scope. They're so different in focus. They're so different in agility. They're so different that in fact, it's very hard to generalize. It's always hard to generalize. And in an emergency, it becomes even more difficult to generalize, which means that essentially people are doing an inordinate amount of work and a lot of stuff is happening, but it's not really, uh, I would say, as coordinated as it could be. And it's each essentially uh, ecosystem is responding to the needs it's, it perceives around it. And this for me is, uh, is been both a problem, but also it's the great strength of the philanthropic sector because it's able to respond to different things at different paces and at different times. And I would say that the response has been, you could divide into three, if we could go to the next slide, uh, just to give you a background picture on who the EFC is. We have 36 members. Uh, many of our members are in Italy, which as you know, is really hard hit, uh, and mostly in Northern Italy, in fact, which is, was even harder hit. Uh, we have German members, we have Dutch members, we have American members, even though we're called the European Foundation Center, and we have UK members. We, 
the I Italian foundations, of course, found themselves very quickly in a situation where they were being called upon uh, to, to do inordinately uh, important things. Uh, next, please. So, um, if we can just go to the next slide uh, again. Thank you. So, uh, the questions we were asked to think about uh, by the moderators were, how are European philanthropies uh, reacting, uh, battling the virus, and uh, how are they leveraging the strengths of different stakeholders and social groups? And how are they protecting vulnerable groups? And what are they doing around the sustainability of the nonprofit sector going forward? And I thought that these were actually very useful ways of approaching this. If we can just start with essentially the crisis, it's upon you, people are uh, in lockdown, and there are some very vulnerable groups, but there's also a, a local governments that are needing to respond to particular uh, situations. If we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so the first thing we did was we, we did a questionnaire to all our members to ask them what they were doing. And we collected this information and we continue to collect it. And if you go to our website, you'll find an updated list of different activities that members are doing. And it goes from very simple uh, responses that have to do with the, uh, the procurement of items. Lumai, you were speaking about the fact that China first got the first masks from Germany. And then, in fact, you supplied protection material to Italy. Well, some of our members purchased uh, items in China and uh, chartered planes and brought them to Italy. Uh, so there was a real example there of where, in fact, we are interconnected globally. And maybe China needed German masks in the beginning. Italy certainly needed some PPE from from, from China, and in fact, foundations played a very important role in procuring it and in getting some of that uh, to, to Italy. It's not all that was needed, but very important things happened. And um, another thing that I think is really important to stress is that it became very important for foundations to rethink what you were saying as well, rethink the way they handle grantees and how they're dealing with grants and how they're dealing with the beneficiaries. And one of the things we did very quickly, together with the uh, uh, DAFNE, which is the Donors and Foundations Networks in Europe, these are the national associations of foundations, and we got foundations to sign up to. Um, and again, you'll find this on our website. I think we're at about, uh, I can't remember exactly how many, but uh, over, over 200 or so foundations that have, have um, signed up for this. And they're basically saying, well, we will listen to our grantees, we will support them, we will be more agile in, in responding, we will give people more latitude, and we will allow people to feel comfortable that they are not going to be deserted in this particular moment in time. So this very important uh, message of, of, of we will support the non-profit, the, 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 the uh, um, uh, civil society organizations that are out there that are already expecting us to do things. And a very close relationship with local government, as I said, so that people weren't duplicating and, and so on. If you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so we have on our website a, a, a list of these things. Please, next slide. And uh, I just want to give you five examples of very specific things that foundations have done. Frankly, I could go on all day about different things that people have done, but I, would, I just picked five that were on that list. Uh, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, uh, which is based in New York, but also in Greece, um, uh, made available $100 million uh, for uh, support to COVID uh, activities globally. They had a specific focus on, on Greece, uh, which is where uh, they have a, an office, but they're also open to other suggestions. And in fact, one part of this, a small part of, of the grant, three, three million, was made available to uh, the uh, uh, university, um, the Rockefeller University for COVID research. So we have other foundations like 
Novo Nordisk, Wellcome Trust, and so on, that have been putting very serious resources into research. The King Baudouin Foundation, which is a small hybrid foundation, it's uh, Belgian, it has um, uh, multiple programs, it also has a base in the US, um, and they announced the US branch of the, of the King Baudouin Foundation. So this is a Belgian foundation that has a offices in New York, uh, announced that they were uh, creating response funds for African countries and are collecting resources to be able to deploy in Africa on COVID-19. Uh, uh, the, the one example of an Italian foundation in the north, the, the Fondazione CRT, Casa di Risparmio di Torino, opened up a, a very large building that they control and manage uh, in order for uh, it to become a temporary hospital. And frankly, real estate, the use of real estate, uh, both as a place for refugees, as, for, as a place for people with COVID or for uh, homeless people has been really quite pronounced. And um, the European Cultural Foundation, which is a foundation that supports culture writ large in Europe, it's based in Amsterdam, decided that this was a very appropriate time to launch a fund to reinforce European solidarity. One of the things you will hear in the subscript of what's happening in Europe is that because uh, the cross, the cross border, the borders were, were locked down, because uh, organized countries began to think in terms of, of, of protecting their citizens, all, of, all the kind of pro uh, pan-European kind of uh, openness has, was, was at risk. And so the European Cultural Foundation felt this was the moment to talk about pro-European, post-seclusion post, uh, 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 kinds of activities. And that brings me to the refugees. So existing programs such as uh, European Foundation of Integration and Migration, which is a pooled fund the different foundations have put resources into for working with migration and, and refugees. We're able also to, 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 to pick uh, some programs in Greece where refugees are to be able to support them uh, in this particular uh, emergency. So these are just five examples, but I, I tell you there are so many, I, I, I could go on all day, um, of, of very different uh, responses that became uh, necessary and frankly, it speaks to the diversity, but also the resilience of the sector that it's able to respond in, in such, such a different way. Um, I wanted to say, I, I was speaking briefly with Elizabeth at the beginning of this uh, session when we were sort of waiting for things to start, that I think we are in the middle of something and it's very appropriate actually that we start with China and now Europe is talking and we'll hear about the United States. But the truth is that we have a lot to learn from you. You have probably learned some lessons we need to learn. But I also want to say, I think we're too much in the crisis. I, I, the amount of work that's happening, the amount of phone calls, the amount of telecommunications, the amount of virtual meetings that are taking place are exponentially much more than anything that was going on before. And I think we are in a mode of responding to a crisis. I've been here before, I've been in emergencies before, and this happens. People put out a lot of energy and they make some mistakes, but they usually invent new ways to do things. You need time afterwards to look back. And so one of my arguments would be, it's going to be very, very important if we as a global community are able to look back and most important, learn the most important things that we ought to be able to do quicker and better next time. Because I think there's a lot of forgetting how people can respond to crises properly. And I think we all get a little bit uh, used to life in a normal context and then in difficult times have to relearn some skills about operating at a different pace, and in a different way. And so my appeal would be, we have to keep the space open to be able to really learn the lessons. And probably we need a bit more time to be able to figure out what are the, what are the essentials to be able to sustain civil society. And I also think there would be such profound changes in all our societies 
that actually we will have to rethink and re reimagine uh, what our relationships are. And I'm hopeful that uh, also this incredibly humiliating experience teaches all incredible humility about what we can do and how assured we are that we have all the answers. And maybe it'll teach us all some serious respect for science. That's my hope. I will stop there. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. It's a very important sharing and um, the examples showed us the agility and the resilience coming from the civil society. But also thank you for sharing with us the very important warning that it's a global community to be able to take the time and space to look back and don't forget, really digest and learn instead of just brushing this away as just another crisis. Um, so let's follow the timeline again, and now I'll move to the U.S. and uh, Elizabeth. The Ford Foundation was set up, uh, if I'm right, 84 years ago, and definitely it's one of the largest foundations in the world with 12 billion USD, U.S. dollar under its belt. So how would you compare the philanthropic community in the U.S. and China reacting to the crisis? Uh, thank you so much um, to everyone. I'm so honored to be uh, on such a distinguished panel and really welcome all the audience and this opportunity to speak with you. I'll say a little bit first about the Ford Foundation and then I have a few comments kind of responding to Professor Lumai and to Jerry's comments and then I'll get to Li Xin's question. Um, so first of all, just quickly, yes, the Ford Foundation was established in 1936 we're an American foundation with our headquarters in New York. We also have 10 other offices around the world in Latin America, Africa, and Asia, including our office in China, which has been, uh, which was established in 1988. So we have a global footprint and we're an American foundation. So I think in this crisis, we have a unique uh, position and role to play that I'll talk about in a minute. The Ford Foundation puts as its primary uh, big problem that it's seeking to address is, is inequality. So this is all kinds of inequality in the world that we think if we can help to make the world more equal and more fair, then more people will be able to benefit and live a productive life. And so that's overall what the Ford Foundation is interested in in addressing. So for example, we are not a foundation that uh, makes grants related to scientific research. So in a situation like COVID-19, the thing that we're concerned the most about are, are the impact on society and the impact on people and particularly vulnerable people. That's not to say that science isn't important, but there are other foundations that focus on those kinds of um, questions and issues and we focus on something slightly different. Um, and so also our mode of operation, unlike CDRF, which is an operating foundation that carries out very important uh, projects themselves, the Ford Foundation is a grant making foundation. So we deploy our resources through other organizations by giving grants that then allow those organizations to do their own work. So. Uh, with COVID-19, because we had an office, we do have an office in China, the Ford Foundation among American foundations was probably one of the first ones to really pay close attention to COVID-19, simply because it was happening in a country where we had staff and we have grantees and we've been operating for 30 years. So we, I think, paid attention to this in its very earliest stages and then obviously continue to pay increasing attention as the disease spread around the world and then eventually came to the United States. So we were able, because of our team on the ground, to respond, I think, quickly and in a, uh, quickly to, the, to COVID-19 in China. So we very early in February made a commitment to about $3 million over three years to do two things. One was to respond immediately to the emergency. So we did make a donation uh, through the Chinese uh, People's Friendship Association uh, to Hubei province uh, for frontline medical relief. So this was an emergency response. There's a problem, we responded. The rest of the funds we have decided to allocate over the next three year period to, and this is getting to Jerry's point about the fact that we're in 
a crisis and we don't really know what the long-term or even medium-term impact of COVID-19 will have on societies and on economies and on sectors of, of societies. So the, the remaining grant funds are earmarked to be spent over the next several years as there become opportunities to learn from COVID-19 and reflect on what we can learn from COVID-19. Uh, with re and that particular fund comes from our China office, so it's related to work in China. So, so that's sort of taking, responding immediately to the crisis, but also trying to begin to think long term. Um, as one of our vice presidents likes to say, one of the important roles of philanthropy is that it allows, that we are allowed to sort of look around the corner. We have a privilege of, um, being able to fund people to think about the future and for ourselves to just try to look a little bit ahead to try to anticipate what needs there might be and what opportunities there might be as a result of this crisis. So that's, I think, one role that philanthropy can play is taking a slightly longer term perspective on what this all means for people and society and economy. Uh, so when the um, as the as the um, as COVID-19 became a global crisis, as it moved away from China and towards Europe and into the United States, and now highly likely to Africa and Latin America, the foundation then really began to step up a whole foundation approach to COVID. So each of our ten regional offices is responding in their region to the need in their region. So in Africa and Latin America, the Middle East and other parts of Asia, each office is responding in its local region. And our New York office is taking, is doing many different things, but one is like, um, like Jerry's uh, Association of Foundations in Europe, we are part of a similar pledge that is hosted by the Council on Foundations, which is the sort of American equivalent to Jerry's organization, that does the same thing. It seeks to uh, engage foundations to commit to being flexible with their current grantees, giving them the ability to pivot their work in response to COVID-19. Not only the emergency medical response, but also the fact that many NGOs are going to be negatively impacted by the economic impact of COVID-19. So lots of NGOs that fundraise from people, from companies, from foundations are going to have a more difficult time raising funds and a more difficult time to do their work. Our president believes that two years from now, the number of NGOs in the United States will have diminished by a considerable number simply because they're not going to be able to survive economically. And we feel that this is a real um, tragedy uh, because NGOs are necessary in society to deliver services and to support vulnerable communities. And so this is something that we hope that all foundations will begin to think about how to support those NGOs to survive and thrive and do their work in the coming years. And so the pledge um, now has about 700 foundations are signed on to it. And I'm sure that there are foundations that have signed both Jerry's pledge and the pledge in the US. And, and we've promoted this in China and the China Found Foundation Forum itself has created a similar pledge for Chinese foundations and has uh, a, a, a good number of foundation of Chinese foundations have also signed on. So this is something that I think we can think about, not just in immediate response to uh, the emergency of COVID-19, but the long-term systemic challenges that are economic in nature that are going to result from the lockdown and the just changes to our, our global economy that are going to be very severe. Um, I'll just say a few more things and then I think we can move on because I, I think the Q&A is going to probably be the most interesting. Um, I would just highlight a couple things. Professor Lu Mai mentioned uh, collaboration and this is really, really important. No single foundation, even a big one, can really address the scale and the size of the challenges that are presented by COVID-19 by itself. 
So it's really important, as CDRF has done, to try to leverage resources from across society, uh, from the private sector, from other foundations, to come together to try to address problems. So the Ford Foundation in the US is part of several donor collaboratives. One is focusing on New York City and on trying to get resources and financing to small businesses and to arts organizations and small organizations that are suffering economically. So we are working with about 16 different foundations. We have about $75 million in that pool to help those communities. We also, in a donor collaborative, looking at low-wage workers. It's a big challenge in the United States. Many, many frontline workers are actually among the lowest paid. And so how can we pool funds to support not only them as individuals, but policy changes that will have a long-term impact on improving the wages of low-wage workers? And finally, we have a, a collaborative fund focusing on people with disabilities who are suffering in a, in a unique way uh, in the COVID crisis. And so how can we collaborate with other foundations and other um, donors to get funds into that vulnerable community? So I think collaboration is really, whether it's within a country or across the borders of, of many countries, is really critical to addressing some of the really serious challenges that COVID-19 brings to us. Um, and so I'll just stop there. I, I, like Jerry, I could talk for a long time, uh, but I do think that it's, it's, it'll be important to hear what people are interested in talking about and um, respond in the Q&A. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. That's very important sharing. And uh, I'm sure we'll come back to many of those uh, in the Q&A part. Um, so when Elizabeth and I brainstormed about the idea of putting together this webinar, we both agree that we should invite a representative from the private foundation set up, set up by Chinese companies. Because it's almost feel like that um, all of a sudden you have a lot of Chinese private foundations, from many of them from the new rich tech companies or the tech gurus, stepping up into the international spotlight. And uh, Jack Ma Foundation donated protective gears and equipments to 150 countries. ByteDance plus TikTok pledged 250 million US dollars globally. So the list goes on. And um, that <clears throat> learning from the peers, but also uh, reacting to the crisis as well. So having with us today, um, uh, uh, Ms. Drew may representing a very young foundation that's only eight months old, but it happens to be exactly in the sector that's uh, addressing the, um, the the virus, so they have interesting experience to share. Now they are, have given the, they have given donations to um, she told me thirty more than thirty countries. So, uh, Ms. Rianne, the floor is yours. Hi, yeah, thank you, Xin, and hello, Lu Lao and uh, Zheng Yao Lao Shi, and uh, Great and uh, Elizabeth. Yeah, nice to meet you. And um, Mahmoud Foundation is quite young, less than one year. Actually, it's, it's set up last uh, August in Shenzhen. And uh, um, we have uh, three uh, sponsor, sponsors, BGI Group. BGI is the largest uh, genome sequencing platform in the world. And uh, one co group and another uh, partners. Um, uh, Actually, at the beginning, we just want to enhance the experimental capability in school and university yeah, based on the BGIS technology capability. And uh, when in the, in the Chinese New Year, I went to Wuhan together with the founder of BGI, and I stay, stay there about 20, year, 20, 20 days. Uh, um, I, uh, in that city, I, I just think about so many hospitals need to need promote their capability um, to test the, the virus. So I, uh, I and my, 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 my partners uh, to start for, uh, looking for some hospital uh, which have not enough capability to detect the virus. And we found 16 hospitals. We, we donate 8 million 
uh, RMB uh, to enhance the, the, the daily uh, testing ability. Uh, average of two, uh, 200 people per day, yeah. So um, after that, um, when uh, it's uh, in, in 12 in February, the chairman of our foundation, uh, Wang Shi, uh, he, he is a famous uh, people in, in Chinese uh, philanthropy uh, uh, community. And uh, he met with uh, uh, the uh, Chinese uh, uh, ambassador in, to, to Japan, um, Kong, Kong, uh, ambassador uh, Kong. Yeah. And uh, he mentioned with uh, about the you know, princess, a diamond princess. At that time, he's, it got a very, you know, it's a little bit disaster. And uh, so uh, Wang Shi promised to, do, to donate uh, 10,000 uh, testing keys to the um, diamond process. And, and uh, at the the uh, volunteer tenth day, uh, you know the fourteen February, and the uh, the the more than the more than ten thousand test testing kits um, to to uh, shipping to the to the uh, not shipping yeah tra uh, transported to the uh, Tokyo. And after that, um, many organizations, uh, including WHO, and also uh, many countries, contacts with us, including Peru, Philippines, and uh, Angola, uh, also Serbia. Yeah. So we start our uh, global journey to donate a testing case. Up to now, we already donate. Um, over 20,000 testing kits uh, to about 30 um, countries, yeah, including a lot, a lot of Africa, African countries. And uh, the next step, um, so we, we start to uh, set up the um, lab in, 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 in the first one in Serbia, um, in, in the survey of the uh, capital. Belgrade, yeah. We already um, finished the, um, the construction. Um, after that, uh, it can be um, sick, it can be uh, detected over thousand, uh, over thousand sample per day, yeah, in the one lab. And and uh, next step, we want to um, help them, help other countries, about ten countries. To set up their own uh, lab, we call it Huo Yan. It's a fire eye. Yeah, no virus can hide, can hidden from that. Yeah. So um, uh, next uh, um, next country will be Canada, um, because uh, uh, eight, eighty two years ago, a very famous the great doctor visit uh, come to China, and uh, he he had done over three hundred surgery. In Second World War II, um, and uh, he passed away uh, due to due to the bacteria and um, efficiency um, in in four in in in, in four months. So, um, he's a, a very good friend of Chinese. So that's why we donate a, a second um, lab in 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 Canada, and. And also, next step will be Greece and uh, um, Thailand. Yeah. Um, so up to up to now, we we already um, we, we already collaborate uh, one foundation, like ten cent uh, foundation, and also uh, a, a like a, a Beijing University alumni to to do a lot of things um, in the world. Um, so, but we we are very young. We we only have five 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 persons in this foundation, and uh, thank you a, a, a lot of friends all over the world. And um, so, of course, based on the BGS technology 
platform. Yeah. So I, I think uh, it's time to upgrade. It's, we should got a new version of human <laughs> after the pand pandemic. Yeah. So we just want to provide the, the total solution uh, to every country. Yeah, every, uh, if we can, uh, every university or hospital. Yeah. And we hope, we hope it should, it's, it's like a, a three, 300 years or it, um, you know, the, 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 the pandemic in Spain. Yeah. So I think that it's really a, 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 turn, a turning point of all of the world. It's like an axo, axo age. We call it the life era for the next uh, hundred years. Yeah. So that um, that's what what we we'll want to do. Yeah. So uh, so nice to to know uh, know you. Uh, I have learned a lot from your your sharing. Yeah. So I I hope to can I hope can she has um, we can met offline not only online. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So okay. yeah, stop here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Yemish, for the wonderful sharing and uh, the effort for a uh, young but also very ambitious foundation. So uh, we, uh, before we start the Q and A, I want to mention two things. One is I took the liberty of extending our meeting to uh, by 15 minutes. So we do have about 25 minutes for Q and A and exchange with our audiences. There's some questions, very good questions out there already. And also let me invite a special guest, our commentator, Dr. Wang Zhengyao, the head of Beijing Normal University. Um, also the, 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 the China uh, Philanthrop Philanthropy Research Institute and also the founding dean of China Global yeah. Philanthropy Institute. So make a few comments, Dr. Wan, and um, maybe you can uh, open the first question, have the first question. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Actually, the three uh, in uh, last, uh, our three very long term good friends, uh, they just speak, including Lu Mai, uh, Jerry and uh, it is a bad. Uh, you know, I must uh, say, you can find uh, we, are, we, are work, we are working together about uh, 30 years or even more time. Actually, our program actually uh, have a very, very good uh, result or, or, or a lot of good fruit. Uh, you can find our students, actually it's uh, more deeply involved or participate uh, the, the, in this time in Wuhan, in China, even in the world. The, even only in China, the foundation or people and people donated more than 40 billion yuan. Actually, a lot of volunteers uh, uh, is uh, on the social workers participate uh, in the process against uh, the COVID-19. Uh, actually, I, I believe the in China, the civil society actually more and more developed, more played more and more important role. I hope in the future, we need more and more cooperation, more and more exchange, then more and more the uh, actually is a learn from each other. I believe this is a, a good, very, very good uh, uh, cooperation today is an exchange of idea. Uh, after tomorrow night, the China Foundation Forum will invite the Chinese foundations uh, exchange some idea. I believe uh, cooperation in China among the more uh, developed. I hope in the future, international cooperation will be more and more uh, developed. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh. Thank you. Um, so with that, we open up for um, Q&A from the audience. And the first question, actually, a, a few questions for Jerry. So I will just bundle them together, if, you, if I may. Uh, the first is, um, has mission creep 
been an issue among the European foundations. Basically, were foundations willing and able to depart from the stated missions to direct resources towards the uh, COVID-19 situation? It's a question basically of agility, using your words. And another question is, can you describe some of the views about what this reimagination of civil society, because you were talking about deeper thinking and looking, looking back once we have the time and see what we learned. And also, will, uh, will, will our relationship to each other, um, how, how that might change? What might, the po what might this post-COVID-19 brave new world look like? Very big question to start with. Uh, well, Thank you so much for the question. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, let me say that mission creep is actually not a big factor in foundations. If, I, if anything, my experience is that they're very good at staying focused on the things they can deliver. But the problem then is that because there are very different foundations with different agendas and with different uh, 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 engagements and with different relationships with different parts of society, some have an international global perspective, some have a very local perspective, uh, they, they differ in what they do. But they, the reason they differ is that they're driven essentially by a very clear focus about what their mission is. And that's, that's the reality. So I don't think there is that big risk. Uh, those that are funding sort of research and so on uh, really have always been very interested in this area. And uh, many of them have been working uh, around, uh, you know, uh, um, essentially pandemics and, and uh, quick uh, risk really to human health and therefore have been putting resources into that and know exactly where to go. Uh, and this is partly why I said things are slightly uncoordinated because it, in fact each foundation stays true to its, to its inner core. Uh, having said that, I think people f uh, really recognize the scale of this and therefore resources have been made available uh, as quickly as possible in order to do new and different things. But not everybody is doing that. Some people are actually uh, also doing exactly what Elizabeth described of saying, well, we have some resources, we, we, we're, we're happy to announce them, but we really are now going to be looking for the things that need to be done as we begin to get a fuller picture of what's happening. So um, I don't think actually foundations are the most agile players in the universe. They are uh, their DNA doesn't allow them to be, in fact. Uh, and it's partly this business of looking around the corner. What's next? What is, it, what is the world we're going to emerge look like? And that takes me to the second question. We don't know. I mean, let's start being honest with each other about these things. We really do not know how deep this is, how difficult it's going to be, what people are going to find. We do, we do know that vulnerable people will be on the receiving end of this people who have lost jobs, people who've lost homes, people who've lost uh, relatives. And so frankly, uh, we really need to begin to think about what, how do we support the society that's going to emerge? And that's what I was making a plea for earlier, is can we take for once an, ability, uh, uh, an opportunity to actually learn some lessons and not forget them? Because I think uh, humanity has a tendency to forget the lessons it learns in emergencies too quickly. And uh, this may be an opportunity for us to hold each other's feet to the fire to try and make sure that we, we, we learn some of those lessons. Um, and I was hinting at some of them. One of them is I, I suspect that the uh, respect for science, which was beginning to look a little bit shaky is going to come back. I mean, people will recognize that there are such things as experts and they can help you, guide you through a process. Uh, and that in fact, part of the uncertainty of this process is really what science is about. So I was listening to somebody say just yesterday, uh, when people talk to me about following the science, uh, I always have to think, well, there are many sciences and maybe there are differences of opinion. So you need to actually be able to engage and be open about the fact that there isn't a one way, one uh, answer for everybody. There are going to be different solutions and there will be some disagreement about what the next step forward is. The more transparent we can be about that, the better, because people can handle uh, disagreements in approach if it's clear 
and if it's not uh, hidden from them. So I think that's the brave new world I'm hoping for, a brave new world where we can discuss differences of approach and uh, attempt to use philanthropy at least for the, the strength it has of being able to take some risks and doing things in the long-term interests of people. Thank you. Transparency and being able to uh, do things, planning things for the long term. Next question is for Professor Lumai. So for the foundations that work in China, um, are you preparing to assist migrant workers who have lost their jobs or depleted all their savings during the crisis? What kind of help should they do you think um, that needed and what numbers do you anticipate? I think most important uh, is to uh, help the uh, government to make a right policy about the urbanization. And during this uh, crisis, uh, someone suggests that maybe the farmers uh, should stay home, or maybe uh, this is uh, China's advantage. The farmer can go back home and then come to the work, but that's not uh, right. Uh, everybody should have uh, equal rights. They can uh, settle down in the city, large city, and we're working on this. Very good uh, uh, news is common already uh, find out that there is uh, two issues they need to deal together. One is uh, uh, the, uh, uh, this uh, pandemic. Another one is the uh, recession. So to deal with the low growth rates, they have to solve the problem to find uh, energy, new energy, an engine for the growth. Urbanization is the one, and the government already has that the documents. The, per, the, the issue we want to do is uh, help government to implement that. We will do assessment, we'll do the calculation, and we will uh, figure it, it out, how much money central government should pay, how much money local government and the company need to join together. This is the one uh, thing. Well, we do learn something, but uh, as Jerry said, uh, the people were very easy to forget. Forget, earthquake happened and then forgot. And then, uh, 2000, 2003, uh, uh, SARS happened and then forgot. We have to remind, remember, uh, help the people remember, and uh, have a serious uh, regulation and uh, improve those uh, systems and uh, prevent. Because uh, uh, many things uh, cost uh, this uh, COVID-19, I, I believe, uh, including climate change. Professor Stern mentioned this. The line between this animal to the human is uh, one reason probably because the human is too close uh, to the uh, uh, animal. But another reason maybe is climate change. It's uh, warming and then uh, help those uh, COVID-19 spread. Next time, maybe will not be 10 years, maybe shorter come so prepare for that and aware we are very close to all those uh, risks thank you so don't waste the lessons we paid so dearly for and our next question for elizabeth um was the basically you said we should look at the long term and ford foundation is in a unique perspective to look for the long term with the diminishing number of ngos um, where does the Ford Foundation see there being most urgent needs in the next two to three years? So thank you for that question. It's a, a very good one. And I want to respond a little bit to some of the previous questions as well in my answer. So I think, as Jerry has pointed out, it's really hard to see today what the future is going to look like even a year from now and certainly two years from now. So really being able to identify um, the specific needs uh, of any society today is a little bit difficult to do. I do think that we can see globally that COVID-19 has revealed 
uh, social inequalities in every country where it has passed through, from China to Europe to the United States. So it has kind of pulled back the curtain on all of our societies to show us where we have the vulnerabilities and each country has their vulnerabilities in a different place. So I think that one of the things that a foundation can do is to um, basically fund research and fund analysis so that, that the experts who are not in the foundation, but the experts can begin to anticipate and see where those vulnerabilities are. And as Lou Mai pointed out, one of the important roles really is government. These are huge, um, the recession and the public health crisis are not solvable by companies or foundations. This really has to take government policy, has to really change to address this, but we can partner with our governments and provide knowledge and information and contribute to the policymaking process in ways to try to influence the outcome to be more equitable and fair. And that's a lot of what the Ford Foundation and most foundations are trying to, to do and accomplish. And I just wanna go back a little bit to the mission creep question. It really isn't about mission creep, but there is a, a, a debate happening in the United States. In the United States, private foundations are required by law to pay a minimum of 5% of their assets every year for charitable purposes. And there, there is a discussion among foundations and about whether that should be higher. Now that we have a global crisis, should foundations pay out higher amounts of their assets in these years, these crisis years, to really help contribute to the recovery in our societies? And the debate is if you pay out too much, then your endowment goes down so much that it's difficult to maintain into the long-term future, your capacity as a foundation. But at the same time, we are in a, an unprecedented moment of crisis. And so there may be a, a reason why now we should be sacrificing more and making bigger commitments because of the nature of the crisis that we're in. And I would say that this is a, a, an open discussion. Boards of, boards of directors of foundations in the United States are actively discussing this. And I think this gets to the question of you know, the role of an organization in the moment of crisis versus its role over a longer period of time. And how do you balance those two things? Uh, and I think it's a really useful and interesting kind of discussion to be had. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, next question for Yemei. Um, you just shared with us, you um, uh, give donations to more than 30 countries. Do you find some of the efforts, the humanitarian efforts exchanges caught in political rhetoric? Does that create a problem for you? And uh, how NGOs, even for a very young NGO, or maybe from uh, uh, Professor Lumai can share that as well, how NGOs can insulate themselves from the political factors and offset some of the trust problems? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, thank you for this, for this question. Yeah. Um, we are really very new for the philosophy community. Uh, up to now, we, we didn't face this kind, kind of problem. Yeah. Every country or organization just welcome our help uh, in no matter color, the color of skin or races or nationalities. We, we don't have this problem up to now. And uh, actually, um, based on the genomics the technology, we just want to save the life. Yeah, Just like uh, uh, in the last uh, 17 years um, history of BGI, uh, we, help, we, we sequenced the SARS um, volume uh, and also the um, uh, E. coli in Germany and um, H h 7 uh, and 9 and so uh, that's what we do, have done in the last uh, 10, 20 years. And uh, we just care the people because uh, I was, uh, I'm a mother, yeah. Um, I, I just don't want to my, 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 my child um, keep away the 
the war room then. And I uh, have more interest in to, to uh, study the um, natural science. Yeah, uh, we, I want to open a window for, for them. Yeah, you, you can you know more your genome, your, your, your health, your body. Yeah, so um, I, I'm, I'm also, I'm not a bi uh, biology um, background. I'm an engineer. Yeah, also I was a professor in Tongji University. So, um, but I believe the, the world need a, need a new community for, for share future. Yeah. Uh, so n not only human, yeah, um, also bad <laughs> animals. Yeah. So for me, I, I, I'm very curious for, for the, uh, for the, uh, for the life world. Yeah. So I, I also donate uh, a, a, a little money to sequence the bat, the source of SARS. Yeah. Also MERS. Yeah. Um, uh, if someone, uh, if anyone have the sample, I, I, I can donate for the cost of the sequencing the, the genome of bat. So uh, I think it's, it's just a um, open, uh, uh, a door or uh, a window for for me, so I can start to learn a little bit of life science. Yeah, <laughs> um, so I think that's a new world for for the mankind. Yeah, so uh, I I hope we can collaborate with each other and uh, yeah, just do uh, what what we can do. <laughs> Yeah. And maybe uh, Dr. Wan can uh, comment on this as well. How do Chinese NGOs insulate themselves from uh, the political rhetoric and um, to some extent the uh, trust deficit? Um, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, it's uh, actually, it's a, one hand is a big challenge to whom uh, mankind, to the world. Uh, it's a, uh, not only uh, a, pan, uh, a pandemic, also about the climate change. You know, it's uh, even the, in China, in Beijing, tomorrow or up on the, after tomorrow, we will meet the, the big, the, the, the temperature, temperature will be more than 30, 35, like a summer. You know, the climate change also is a zero. I think is uh, nature actually give us a big uh, lesson. It's, uh, they, they told us we need to change. Chinese NGO or Chinese philanthropist showed more and more cooperation, more and more collaboration, more and more support to the world. We have a responsibility. We need a, one hand, we need to learn learn much more, but on one hand, we, we, we need, you know, the, the support of the world when they match the, when they meet the difficulty, we, we need the support. I, I believe uh, this is the last three months is a good beginning. Uh, we need to follow, we need the more and more work. Thank you, thank you. And I'm mindful that Jerry have to go <laughs> in a few minutes. So uh, before you go, let me, um, there's one question for you and Elizabeth. So you both mentioned the uh, financial pressure on the philanthropic organizations in the coming years. Then that looks like a twin threat, rising demand for the services, but much less income from the financial investor, investment or corporate or household donations. Um, do many philanthropic organizations need to merge? Do such organizations simply become the arm of the government as it can help finance them? You have to unmute. Uh, which okay. Are oh. okay, there you so go. I'll go. You mind? Uh, I'm sorry, because I have another uh, thing I have to do immediately after this. Um, I, I actually think that the truth is that we don't know quite how foundations endowments are going to be affected. I mean, this is something that is worrying incredibly a lot of foundation leaders because it's a, it's a real issue, right? Uh, and, and so the 5% rule that, that Elizabeth was talking about is a real 
issue. Can, is this the time to increase this? And I, I think this debate is a very healthy one. Having said that, uh, foundations sometimes can act counter-cyclically, and they do. And, uh, already in Europe, we've seen foundations engage with this crisis by doing counter-cyclical things, spending more money uh, because they have some in reserve and they uh, you know, put it aside for this and so on. So they were able to do that. Uh, having said that, one of the things that I was on a conference call with WINGS about a week ago, WINGS is the Worldwide Association of Foundations, and speaker after speaker that was talking from all over the world was talking about unprecedented amounts of goodwill and resources from the public in different parts, in different countries. So actually a growth in Latin America, in Africa, in Europe, in the United States of ordinary citizens pooling resources because they want to respond to this crisis. So this is also an incredible example of how people rise to challenges. So yes, people are worried about resources. Yes, there is a ambiguity about what the future holds, but there's also an incredible, uh, you know, human response to a crisis which we, is palpable. You can see it. You can see the resources are coming in for institutions. And uh, one person after another kept saying how unprecedented this was, that some organizations were raising in a matter of days what they had taken years to raise in the past. This is fast, absolutely, it vindicates civil society and human beings and the way in which reciprocal relationships work. Reciprocity and philanthropy are very much the same kind of thing. I'll stop there. I could go on forever. Thank you, thank you, Jack. Julissa? I'll just say something very quick. So I think that that same phenomenon of um, people responding has been very evident in China as well. I'm sure that Lu Mai, Wang Zhengyao, and Zhuyan Mei can talk to that. It really, these moments in China, whether it's the Wenchuan earthquake or this mm -hmm. moment really reveal the power of society uh, and individuals in China as well. And then in terms, just really one quick response to the question, which was should um, philanthropies or NGOs merge with the government and et cetera, I, I would say that we should avoid that trend. It's very important that um, civil society remain separate from the government because the two play very important and different roles. And we need a strong government we also need to have a strong civic sector where people can participate and with a wide variety of organizations that respond to different kinds of problems. And a lot of the times the civil society and the civic sector and philanthropy are much more flexible and agile and respond more quickly. Governments take a little bit longer to change. So those two, parts and then the private sector, all three play very different roles and they're important to be all equally healthy and all equally moving forward and not merged into one gigantic entity. Uh, at least that would be my hope and expectation. Thank you. And we're running out of time and uh, it's a shame that time goes by so quickly and um, bye Jerry, <laughs> you have to go. Um, last question I'll throw to uh, Professor Lu Mai, and you have the last word. It's a question for everyone, but I, uh, um, uh, I hope you can uh, uh, represent us to answer that. And thank you for your sharing of your hard work. The question is, is there a space for public to participate in your foundation's good work? Uh, you have to unmute yourself, Professor Lu Mai. Oh. Unmute. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, my colleague listened uh, that Elizabeth said and uh, said, oh, we have an issue of survival. That's a CDF, <laughs> never think about that. So we need uh, two things. One is a uh, new idea. If we have no new idea, we cannot uh, uh, work as a nonprofit organization. And the second, we should have a more resilience we need to set up some fund or prepare for the, the, the bad day. Uh, CDF now try to work with uh, uh, many partners uh, together, especially for those uh, rural uh, issue and uh, for the migrants uh, to the city and uh, so on. So we 
hope we can have uh, some volunteer who graduated yeah. from university and uh, now want to have uh, some experience uh, in the poor area for one or two years. Those uh, volunteer we hire usually is from local, but this time we want to go to best university to find a best, best partner. Mm -hmm. And uh, some others also, well, we need to work together, like uh, earlier child development. Now different is government department come to us, not we go, we go to them. So it's a good size for the, to see the government try to do some good job. And uh, we hope this uh, uh, public-private uh, partnership can uh, extend it. And uh, I would like to learn from a Ford Foundation for non-profit organization. We need to remember one thing. Some uh, foundation donate a small amount of money and then ask the local government, not us, but uh, say a big story. Uh, 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 so local government do not like that. And I think foreign country, government or public also do not like that. Don't do that. Do something from uh, your heart and then do not uh, ask uh, some return, especially some fame, some, that's not, 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 not real things. So uh, not uh, ask uh, some return. That's Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you to all our speakers and thank you to all the participants for the good question and for the attention. Let me borrow one phrase I learned today is just learn from the foundations that we look around the corner. And that's exactly why we uh, set up this session and uh, we think about the future from the human angle. And so the lessons we learned so dearly at the COVID-19 crisis won't be wasted. So uh, thank you for your participation and uh, stay tuned. Um, uh, the sharing today can be found on the uh, Taishan Global website. So stay safe. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Huh?